your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. If I can have the New King James Version, I will, I will appreciate. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. One of the epistles that was written by Paul. Amen. If you're there, shout amen. If you're not yet there, say, wait for me, Pastor Cliff, and I will wait for you. <laughs> I, will, I will try. Now, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor this morning, be anxious for nothing. <laughs> be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So this afternoon, by the grace of God, I want to share on the subject, be anxious for nothing. You don't think it's powerful? This side is very quiet. They don't think it's powerful. Be anxious for nothing. I pray, oh God, this morning that this message will be a life-changing message to some needy souls. I pray this morning that you may address a specific issues, oh God. Deliver somebody. Break struggles in somebody's life. Bless somebody. And them that are blessed, I pray, oh God, that you may usher them to the next level of blessing in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on, put your hands together and give Jesus a shout of praise. Well, you may have your seats this morning in the presence of God. Amen. It's, 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 I'm glad this morning to bring forth the word of God. And I pray this morning that I will be a blessing, a blessing to you. And I pray this morning you shall have expectant hearts, expectant hearts ready to receive what God has in store for you. I'd like to take this moment and appreciate my dad and mom for the opportunity to bring forth the word of God. Amen. Dad and mom, I love and I appreciate you. I can't start preaching the word of God without appreciating my wife. She's one, she's one of the most beautiful lady in the whole world. Very humble, very quiet. But she's a blessing to my life. We've been married for the last... It's, in, in October, we'll be getting to nine years. Yeah? And God has blessed us with a twin, a set of twin, a boy and a girl. And we bless the Lord for that. Amen? Be anxious for nothing. Now, the story is told of a man who said to his friend... I'm really in trouble. I have a mountain of credit card debt. I lost my job. My car is being repossessed. And my house is in foreclosure. But I am not worried about it. How can you not be worried? Asked his friend. I have hired a professional warrior. And he does all my worrying for me, said the man. His friend replied, that's fantastic. So how much does a professional warrior cost? $50,000 per year. Wow, that's expensive. So where are you going to get the to get that kind of money. The man replied, I 
don't know, but that's for him to worry about. Some of us will get it when we are having, when we are having lunch. Amen? Then there's one more story. There's a story of a man whose co-workers noticed that he was a worried, worried man. So someone asked him, what are you so worried about? And he said, a few years ago, I went home one day and my wife was whistling T for two, T for Two, shortly thereafter, we had twins. The next year, I went home, and she was watching the three musketeers on television. Shortly after, we had triplets. Then they said to him, so why are you worried now? He said, last night, when I went home, she was reading the book, The Bath of a Nation. <laughs> Amen? So there's a certain woman who for years had been living with the tension of all her various responsibilities at work, at home, in the church, and in the community. And one day she went to the doctor for a checkup. And she told the doctor, I'm not sure what's going on in my life. I feel all run down. After the doctor had her out, he asked her some questions. And upon the completion of her exam, the doctor said, the trouble isn't so much that you are all run down, but that you are all wounded. I don't know if someone can relate with me this morning, but the reason why we are all run down is because we are all wounded. We push ourselves because there is so much to do. And we become anxious about getting everything done. And we reach the point where we overdo it and break down. Now, the mechanical engineers say that every metal has a fatigue limit. Somebody say a fatigue limit. Now, fatigue limit is the point at which the metal breaks under extreme tension and stress. And we human beings, we have a fatigue limit. This is the point we either break down or lose control. Because when we are caught in the grip of unrelenting stress, hour by hour, day after day, then the least amount of added pressure brings us close to the fatigue limit. But what can we do? Because the pace of life is demanding. We can't just stop. And maybe this morning you feel like the businessman who said, I can't keep going because I am tired. But the other thing is, I can't stop. I can't stop. Now, we might not be able to make life stop, but that doesn't mean we have to be anxious about what life brings. Amen? Now, it's worth also mentioning this morning that a certain amount of tension is a good thing. The rubber band needs to be tightened so that it can be useful. The guitar strings, probably Minister Dennis can bear with witness with me, that it needs to be tightened so that it can produce a good 
sound. We need to draw back a bowstring in order to shoot an arrow. So it is with us. The right amount of tension keeps us active. The right amount of tension keeps us sharp. But you need also to understand that too much of it will make us break like the rubber band, like the guitar string or the bow string. Can I get an amen from somebody? Now, our text this morning says, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. Now, anxiety is described as a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease about things, situations. verses 25, he said, do not worry. Therefore, verses 25 says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? And he says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or st- I do not more, much more valuable than they. Then verses 27 says, Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Listen to verses 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Verses 30 says, If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and is nowhere tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So the Bible says, do not worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and it says, your heavenly Father knows that you need them. The imperative command includes, in the scripture that we've read, on what we eat, what we wear, and what tomorrow may Bring. So having anxiety over these things is a great waste of energy. If you're worried about tomorrow and it's still today, you're robbing yourself the joy of your day and wasting it on something that is not here even yet. Again, Jesus commands us in the same book, verses 34, and says, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day as its own trouble. Worrying about tomorrow is like borrowing trouble with interest and paying the not today. Can I say that again? Worrying about tomorrow with interest and paying. Worry is a Worry will rob you of your peace of mind. It's not good for your health. It's something to battle with, whether we are young or old, poor or rich, literate or illiterate. We worry. And for some, because of their personality, They worry too much. But the fact remains that we all worry. 
Although we cannot eradicate it entirely from our experience, we can handle, we can learn to handle worry in the right way. Let me give you some few synonyms for anxiety. I'll just give you a few sampling that I got them from thesaurus. Somebody said thesaurus. Thesaurus. <laughs> One of the synonyms is abhorrence. <laughs> Agitation. Aversion. Concern. These are synonyms of anxiety. Yeah? Consternation. Cowardice. Distress. Dread. Faint-hearted. Foreboding, fright, horror, suspicion, terror, timidity, trembling, tremor, trepidation, and ease, and finally, worry. Finally, worry. You see, worry is an integral part of humanity. Ever since Adam and Eve started their worry about being naked, they sealed fig leaves to cover their nakedness and hid in the bushes to avoid being questioned or punished by God. Therefore, worry has become an integral part of human nature. People naturally worry about their personal welfare. Most of us worry about the welfare of our loved ones. We worry about the welfare of our brethren. We worry about our friends. We worry about our neighbors. We even worry about people that we do not even know. We worry about our fellow countrymen. We worry about the widows. We worry about the orphans. We worry about the poor. We worry about the sick and the oppressed. We almost literally worry about everything. We worry about our jobs. We worry about our homes. We worry about our favorite stop, favorite sport teams. We worry about our favorite sports, stop, sport teams. Yeah, Chelsea fans in the house. They are worrying, they are worrying. Right now we are in this service, but they are worried. Are we going to get the same beatings that we got last week? We are worried. We are worried. We are worried. Sometimes we worry about, about individual players in the team. We are worried if Pogba will be able to make it or not. We are worried about Messi. We are so worried. We worry about our food. The other day we had issues with the meat. And we got worried about it. We worry about the water that we drink. I mean, we literally worry about everything. We worry about little diseases that are mentioned in the news. We worry about our schools, our children going to schools. We worry about the electrical grid. We worry about crime. We worry about drugs. We worry about the economy, especially these days. We worry about politics. We worry about foreign relations. We worry about the traffic while going to our places of work. We even worry about the weather. And now we even worry about our climate. We are having conferences on climate change. We worry. We worry. We worry a lot. The ignorant worry because they don't know enough. The knowledgeable worry because they know too much. The rich worry because they are afraid of losing what they have. The poor worry because they don't have enough. The old worry because they are facing death. The young worry because they are facing life. Parents worry about the children they have. Childless couples worry about the children they don't have. Single men and women worry if they ever get married. Married men and women worry, thinking, why did I ever get married? I'm talking about worry. Statistics. 
and talking about worry, statistics show that 40% of what you worry about will never happen. 30% of what you worry about or fear are things that happened in the past and can't be changed. 10% of what we worry about are considered by most to be insignificant issues. 12% of what we worry about are issues about our health that will not happen. So this means that the 92% of what we fear or worry about will never take place. Now, it should be meaningful this morning to realize that there is only 8% of anything we worry about that can be considered legitimate concern. And please realize this morning that the remaining 8% does not get solved by worrying about it either. Because worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it will not take you anywhere. Nothing in this life gets sorted out by worry. You can sort out your financial problems by worrying about them. You can sort out your marriage issues by worrying about them. Worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't take you anywhere. It is a fact, but yet we still remain worried. May God help us in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, God help us. Now, the book of Philippians is a powerful letter of encouragement by Paul to the guys in Philippi. And Philippians uh, chapter 1, Paul opens up with a prayer of a thanksgiving. And he prays for us to abound in love, knowledge, and depth of insight. Paul shares intimate thoughts about his desire to be with Christ and encourages believers to stand firm in their faith till the end. Philippians at chapter 2, Paul takes time to encourage us to be like-minded and one in the spirit. Paul exhorts us to follow the example of Christ, who humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. He reminds us to have the same attitude as Christ. Philippians chapter 3, Paul warns against placing confidence in things that make us look good by human standards. Paul mentioned his many achievements before counting them as garbage in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ and his righteousness by faith. Then he encourages us to forget everything that is behind and press on towards the mark of the price of the higher calling that is in Christ Jesus. Then we learn in Philippians at chapter 4, and I see Paul behind prison doors, and he is writing to the children in Philippi, and he is saying, rejoice, and again I say, rejoice. I don't know what kind of prison you are in this morning, but it's my prayer that you are going to rejoice in the name of Jesus. You might be in a prison of my finances might be in, you might your finances might be in a, your finances might be in a prison, but it's my prayer this morning that you are going to rejoice in the name of Jesus. Things might not be working out for you. Probably in your workplace, in your business, things might not be working out for you, but it is my prayer this morning that you will rejoice. Somebody say amen. amen. May you receive the joy of the Lord this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. amen. And we learned in verses 6 and 7. And I hear Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If there is one person who for the spirit of anxiety more than anybody else, then it is Paul. 
Let me show you from the scriptures a little bit of Paul's journal so that you can be able to encourage yourself. Acts chapter 21, Paul arrives in Jerusalem and the Bible says the whole city erupts in violence. Acts chapter 22, the Bible says he speaks to the crowd and at the end of the day, they shout at Paul, read the earth of him. He is not fit to live. Later, the Bible says a Roman centurion prepares to flog him just for causing a ruckus. It's only, Paul, it's only when Paul tells him about his citizen that he spares him. Acts chapter 23, Paul preaches to the Sanhedrins. And the Bible says more than 40 Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat and drink until they see Paul has been killed. The Roman guards had to whisk him away through the night to Caesarea to save his life. Acts chapter 24, Paul stands trial before Felix and is put under house arrest for two years. Acts chapter 25, it says he is tried before Festus, then later King Agrippa. And the Bible says he appeals to Caesar and he travels to Rome. And the Bible says he experiences a dreadful storm. The ship is destroyed. The passengers are saved only by Paul's prayers and by holding on to planks and pieces of wood. They are washed ashore on Malta. The Bible says he's beaten by a poisonous snake. He's treated like a god by the natives. And finally, after spending the winter there, the Bible says he arrives in Rome. Then Acts chapter 28 says he is put behind bars in Rome. When I say behind bars, I mean prison, not behind, let's remain spiritual. He's put behind bars, not the other bar. He's put behind prison. So the question tonight, the question this morning arises, do you think Paul had things happen in his life that he could be anxious about? Listen to what he says. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 24, of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with roads. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In sojournings, often in perils of water. In perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And it says, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. And this is beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Then he says, who is weak? I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. Paul passed through all this, but he could Afford to stand and say, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Because anxiety is a bad spirit. You've got to deal with it in the name of Jesus. You can't afford to have pity parties with the spirit. You have to break it in the name of Jesus. Because if you don't break the spirit of anxiety, it will distract you so that you lose focus on what is important in life. Anxiety will sinful away your joy and make you judgmental and negative. Anxiety will steal your contentment. 
Anxiety will steal your confidence. Anxiety will steal your ability to trust in God. Worry and anxiety are robbers of the good things in life. That's why Solomon said in the book of Proverbs 12, 25, an anxious heart weighs a man down. An anxious heart, an anxious heart weighs a man down. Can I get an amen from somebody? Now this morning, I wanted to give you three antidotes of anxiety. Then I'll be out of your way. Three antidotes of anxiety. Antidote is simply a medicine taken or given to counteract a particular poison. Anxiety is a poison. It's a poison. We've got to bring it down in the name of Jesus. The Bible says in the way Paul introduced it that do not get worried about anything but prayer. Do not be anxious about anything but by prayer. Antidote number one, pray. Somebody say pray. pray. Now the power of prayer should not be underestimated. The power of prayer should not be underestimated. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The Bible says Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed earnestly that it will not rain in the face of the earth for three and a half years. And the Bible says he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. God most definitely listens to prayer. God answers prayers, and God moves in response to prayers. Now, Jesus taught in the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 20, I tell you the truth, if you have a faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible. Second Corinthians chapter, four, chapter 10, verses 4 to 5, the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Amen? Do you know that scripture? Or oh, I'm seeing my own, my own things. Am I seeing my own things? <laughs> the Bible also urges us that we need to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. I want you to understand this morning that the power of prayer is not the result of the person praying. Rather, the power resides in the God whom we pray to. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15, it tells us this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, God hears us and if we know that God hears us whatever we ask we know that we have what we ask of him no matter the person praying no matter the passion behind the prayer or the purpose of the prayer God answers prayers that are in agreement with his will and his answers are not always yes, but they are always in our best interest. When we pray passionately, when we pray purposefully, according to God's will, God responds powerfully. 
Let me give you some few examples of the power in prayer. The power of prayer will overcome the enemies. Psalms chapter 6 verses 9 to 10, it says, The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. And it says, Let all my enemies be ashamed and so vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. The power of prayer conquered death. You remember the story of the Shunammite son and Elisha. The son was dead and Elisha approached in the scene and prayed for the son who was dead and he came back to life. The power of prayer brings healing. James uh, chapter 5 verses 14 says, is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Demons were defeated by the power of prayer. Jesus said in the book of Mark chapter 9, verses 29, some of these things do not go, but through prayer and Fasting, God, through prayer, opens our eyes. He changes our hearts. He heals our wounds and grants us wisdom. James chapter 1 verses 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men library, and upbraid it not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Amen? And the, you need to understand also this morning that the power of prayer should not be underestimated because it brings or draws the glory and might of the infinite God of the universe. That's why Daniel said in the book of Daniel chapter 4 verses 35, all the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. God does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the people of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? The power of prayer should never be underestimated. When faced with important life-changing decisions, don't be anxious. Pray. The Bible says, do not be worried, but pray. Do not be worried about your family. Pray for them. Do not be worried about your finances. Pray for your finances. Do not be worried about your business. Pray for your business. Do not be worried about your health. Pray for your health. Do not be worried about your children. Lay your hands on your children and plead the blood of Jesus over their lives. Do not be worried about anything but pray. The greatest tragedy of life is not an answered prayers, but an offered prayers. The greatest tragedy of life is not an answered prayers, but an offered prayers prayers. Do not be worried about anything but by prayer and supplication. Number two, supplication. Number two, antidote, supplication. Somebody say supplication. Supplication. Now Paul says, do not be anxious about anything but prayer and supplication. Prayer versus supplication. In the book of Philippians, we come across these two types of prayer. Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, with all prayer and supplication. So what is the difference between prayer and supplication? Because most people regard both terms describing prayer with no difference between them. What is the difference between prayer and supplication? Because Paul says, do not be anxious 
about anything but by prayer and supplic prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Now, supplication is a form of prayer, but considered as kneeling down and bending down, in which someone makes a humble petition or entreat the Lord. Prayer, on the other hand, can be defined as a sincere thanksgiving or request made to God. Unlike in prayer, where this is not necessarily so, there is always a request in supplication. Now, in prayer, one asks for or desires something from God. In prayer, they may not be request, but only praise showered on God. For example, a person praying may say, bless my family. person praying may say, thanks for saving me. Thanks for saving my son's life and the like. But the person who is crying to God down on his knees for the cure of his ailing wife injured friend or similar is involved in supplication. The Bible says in the book of Zechariah 12, 10, the first portion, God says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. May you receive the spirit of grace and supplication this morning in the name of Jesus. Now, the word supplication, let me teach some more. The word supplication comes from a Latin term, supplicare. Somebody say supplicare. Supplicare means to plead humbly and has the word supple as its root. Supple means to bend quickly or able to change quickly and successful, successful to suit different situations. Amen? So when we pray with supplication, we are not only humbling, submitting our request to God, we are doing it with a mindset of allowing our minds to be supple and receptive to God's will. We want God to mold our thinking, our opinions, and our emotions to be in line with his thinking, with his opinion, and with his emotions. And when this happens, God changes us to be more like his son, which changes our desire and our will to be in line with his will. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, I found that again in the Hebrew word. Somebody say Hebrew word. Hebrew. Supplication is translated as chala. Somebody say chala. C-H-A-L-A-H. -H. Some people, it depends with your Hebrew teacher. Some say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kala. K-H-A-L-A-W. L-A-W, yeah? Color, something like that. But it's chala, depending with your Hebrew teacher. Amen? <laughs> Somebody say chala. So it comes from a root that can also mean to be rubbed, or to be worn, or to be weak, or to be sick, or to be afflicted, or to be grieved, as well as entreat. So the question this morning is, why do I come to God in supplication? I come to God in supplication because life has consi consistently rubbed me so hard that I'm feeling worn out. I come to God in supplication because temptations are all around me and I'm feeling weak. I come to God in supplication because I am sick and maybe troubled or afflicted over what the diagnosis might be. I come to God in supplication 
Because the enemies and false brethren might also afflict me. I come to God in supplication because I'm grieved maybe over a divorce or a death of a loved one. I come to God in supplication because I have a special desire that I want the Lord to entreat and fulfill it. Do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Number three, antidote, thanksgiving. Somebody say thanksgiving. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but prayers, supplication, and thanksgiving. What is thanksgiving this morning? Thanksgiving is the expression of gratitude, especially to God. And what is gratitude? Gratitude is the quality of being thankful, readiness to show appreciation for, and to return kindness. The Bible says in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 18, Paul says, be joyful always. Pray continually. Giving thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Paul challenges to be joyful despite the challenges we face off in life. And God's will, God's desire is that you be thankful in all situations. It, mat it doesn't matter the seasons of life you're in. God says you ought to be thankful. You ought need to have an attitude of gratitude. You need to have it in your neck. Everywhere you go, you go with it. An attitude of gratitude. It's God's will, God's desire that you be thankful. Listen to what Habakkuk says in the book of Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17. Habakkuk says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, Though there are no fruits in the vine, though the labor of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there are no herd in the stall, Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation. It was easier for Habakkuk to fall into the state of being anxious, but he chose to be thankful. Habakkuk commits to thanking God regardless of external circumstances. And the opening of this verse delineates a catastrophe. And the Bible says there were no fruits in the fig tree. There were no grapes growing on the vine. There were no olive. There were no fruit produce of any kind. There was a lack of sheep. There was a lack of cattle. And after this doleful description, Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Can I submit to you this morning that Habakkuk's joy was not dependent on his physical blessings. Even if Habakkuk suffered extreme loss, he was determined to be thankful to God. Habakkuk remembered God's goodness in times past and concluded that God is worthy of praise. The prophet said he might lack olives and grapes, but he will never be without 
God. Are we together? Number two, on the same scripture, Habakkuk praises God for salvation. And he says, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Because God could save. And that God is salvation. Then thirdly, Habakkuk recognized the Lord as his strength. He says, God the Lord is my strength. This statement is the central focus of Habakkuk's prayer. May God's strength be your central focus this morning in the name of Jesus. Spirit of anxiety will not take the center stage in your life in the name of Jesus. Now you need to understand also this morning that the truth of God's present strength caused Habakkuk to trust God even in difficult situations. And like Habakkuk, we can choose to thank God. We can choose to thank God in the face of desolation. We can choose to thank God in the face of anxiety. Like Habakkuk, we can thank God for the salvation he provides in Jesus Christ. And by seeing God as our strength, as our source of strength, like Habakkuk, we can trust God's promises. I want to let you know this morning that thankful hearts come as we recall all those acts of deliverance which God brought into our lives. We can and should be thankful for these acts. But I venture to say this morning that most people take their good fortune, their health, their wealth, their warm clothes, and food for granted or seeing them as their due. They are not thankful, but expect it as something that is owed by life or by God. It is not owed but given to you freely by God. When we realize that everything in life, everything that we possess, everything that is called by our name is not ours, comes from God, then we won't have a hard time being thankful. In every situation, we need to be thankful it doesn't matter the battles you're facing in life. You ought to be thankful. Your finances might not be working right, but God says you ought to be thankful. You might not have a roof on your head, but God says you need to be thankful. You might not be eating in the five-star hotel, but at the end of the day, you have something on your table. God says you ought to be thankful. You ought to be thankful. You might not drive the latest car, but at the end of the day, you are able to walk. God says you ought to be thankful. 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 Let me read the last scripture so that we can, we can pray. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 from the King James Version. Anytime I hear about thankful, being thankful, God refers me back to that scripture. Anytime that I feel puffed up, anytime that I begin to be proud, God refers me back to that scripture. And the Bible says, hearken to me. This is God speaking this morning. And he says, hearken to me. Listen, listen, and listen very well. And he says, ye that follow after righteousness, them that are called by his name, them that are washed in the blood of Jesus. Them that are made whole. When God sees you through Christ Jesus, he sees righteousness. He says, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Do you have seekers of the Lord in this place this morning? Do you have seekers of the Lord? God says, ye that seek the Lord. And then he says, look unto the rock. 
Who is the rock? Jesus is the rock. He is the rock of ages. He is the solid rock on which we stand. Look at the rock. The rock where you've been hewn from. Look at the rock where you've been hewn from. To be hewn simply means to be chiseled. It simply means to be shaped. God says, I shaped you so that you can be like me. You are shaped into the image of God. God says, look where I brought you from. Look where I chiseled you from. Some of us were unfaithful, but God chiseled us so that we can be like him. Some of us were drunkards, but God chiseled us so that we can be like him. Some of us were liars, but God chiseled us so that we can be like him. Some of us were self-righteous, but God chiseled us so that we can be like him. Look unto the rock where you've been hewn from. Look unto the rock where you've been shaped from. And Jesus said, look unto the hole of the pit where you did. God is calling you to a place of remembrance. Anytime you think you're puffed up, that is the scripture for you. Anytime you think you're proud, that is the scripture for you. God says, look at the hole of the pit where you have been digged from. In other words, God says, we've been digged from holes. Some of us were digged from holes of unrighteousness. We've been digged from holes of unfaithfulness. We've been digged from holes of bitterness. We've been digged from holes of uh, self-righteousness, anger, rebellion, disobedience. We've been digged from holes of pride. We've been digged from holes. And we couldn't come out of those holes by our own strength. We tried, but we failed. That's why God says, look at the place. Look at the place where I picked you from. Some of us were serious drunkards. But still God says, I picked you from that place. I picked you from that place. Look at the hole. Look at the hole. Look at the hole. And some of us, we tried to come out by ourselves, but we couldn't. It was God who brought us out. And I want to tell you this morning, I want to tell you this morning, that if God didn't pick you from that hole, you wouldn't be here this morning. You wouldn't be here this morning. Some of us would have been dead long time ago. If, if, if God left you in that hole of drunkenness, you are serious drunkard. And if God had left you for one day in that hole, you would be dead by now. Some of us would have committed suicide in this place a long time ago. If God de deliver you from that hole of depression, you are so depressed. It was only God who could pick you out from that hole. Look at the hole. Look at the hole. Anytime you feel puffed up, God says, look at the hole. Anytime you feel on top, God says, look at the hole. Look at the hole where I picked you from. And God says, I picked you up and set you up. I picked you up and set you up. He is the same God who picked Rahab from the hole of prostitution and set him up to be one of the greatest people in the lineage of Jesus. He is the same God who picked Abraham from the hall of idolatry and set him up to the father of all nations. He is the same God who picked Joseph from the dungeon and made him a governor. I'm so glad this morning that God picked me up. I don't know where I could be this morning, but I'm grateful that God picked me up. I would have lost my mind if God didn't pick me up. I would have a nervous breakdown if God didn't pick me up. I would be dead by now if God didn't pick me up from that hole. I'm so glad this morning that God picked me up. I'm so glad this morning that God picked me up. I don't know what you thank God for this morning, but I thank him for picking me up. I'm so glad that he picked me up. I don't know what you're grateful this morning, but I thank God for picking me up. Thank God for your new car, but I thank him for picking me up. Thank God for your spouse this morning, but I thank him for picking me up. Thank God for your business deals, but I thank him this morning for picking me up. He picked me up. He picked me up. He picked me up. 
I don't know where I could be this morning. If God didn't pick me up, he picked me up. Bible says once we were not a people, but now we are. Once we are not a people, but now we are. Once we had not obtained, obtained mercy, but now we have received mercy. And Paul says, as I finish, he declares, in those times you are anxious, you still have a reason to be grateful to God. You have a reason to be grateful to God. And finally, he says, when you work on these antidotes, when you work on them, 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 this is what, that scripture, can we have it again as I finish? Philippians 4, 6, sorry, Philippians 4, 6, Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, be anxious for nothing. And God says, in everything by prayer, when we work on that antidote, then we come to antidote number two, supplication. Then we come to antidote number three, thanksgiving. God says, whatever you request, whatever you request, I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. God says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious, my son. Don't be anxious, my daughter. I know the challenges that you're facing, but don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Don't, don't be worried. Don't be worried. Don't be worried about your children, that someone is going to molest them, that someone is going to kidnap them. Don't, don't, don't be worried. Don't be worried. Bible says pray. Pray, 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 pray. Your business might be going down, but God says don't be worried. Don't be worried. Don't be worried. Pray, pray, pray. You might be having issues in your marriage. Things are not working out right, but God says pray, 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 pray. Pray, 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 pray. Your relationship with your children might not be the best relationship, but God says you, 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 don't be worried. Don't be worried. Don't be anxious about it. You've got to. You've got to pray. And probably this morning you're dealing with awkward children and, and, and you've reached the end of yourself. And you, know what, you don't know what is going to happen. God says, do not be anxious about your children this morning. Do not be anxious about them. You've got to pray for them. You've got to pray for them. And once we work on this antidote, God says, whatever you ask, I'll do it for you. And it closed by saying, I'll give you peace. Give you peace. I give you peace that surpasses all human understanding. Peace that you've never experienced it anywhere. That is the peace that God is going to give you. When you face those challenges, God says, in the midst of those challenges, I'm going to release a peace, a peace that you've never experienced before. Things might not be right, but God says, there's a peace that is coming upon you. Things might not be working the way you want them to work, but there is a peace that God is working behind the scenes. God is working behind the scenes. All he desires for you is to pray, serve supplication, and thanksgiving. Because I'm working, I'm working behind the scenes. He's working behind the scenes. He's working behind the scenes. And, 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 and God is saying, God is saying, I'm about, I'm about, I'm about to present you. I'm about to present you on the stage so that people can see that I've been working on the scene been working on the sin and probably they talked they talked about your marriage that said that things are not going to get better in your marriage but God is behind the sins is behind the sins he's working it out and he says in due course I'll present you I'll present you so that you can see what is happening things might not be working with your children but God says I'm, I'm, I'm behind the sins do not be anxious about anything do not be anxious about it. I'm, I'm, I'm putting A and B. And it might seem confusing, uh, putting A and B. And, and you might feel tired. You might feel you confuse you. You might feel things are not working out. But God says, hold on to prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Because I'm about to present. I'm about to present you. 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 Do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. God says things will work out. Things will work out. Things will work out. Things will work out. And some of us might be in this place. They don't know what the next step they're going to take when they leave this place. Because things are not working out at home. Things are not working out there in their families. Things are not working out. God says in his word, relax. Relax. I've got it. I've got it covered. 
be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Let's rise up on our feet. I want you, I want you for the next few minutes, I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to open up your mouth and say, God, I need help. I need help. I've been anxious most of the time, but Lord, I need a turnaround. I don't want to be anxious anymore. I don't want to live an anxious life. I want to live an anxious, a free life in the name of Jesus. I want to be a man. I want to be a woman of prayer. A woman of supplication, a man, a woman of thanksgiving. I want you to raise up your voice and begin praying in this place in the name of Jesus. I can hear you pray. 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 I